Hey, everybody, my guest today for return engagement is Christian Westbrook, who is an agricultural researcher, author, and he is the founder of the Ice Age Farmer broadcast, IceAgeFarmer.com, which looks deeply at the future of our food supply from the agenda to centralize control of food and defile our diets with insects, chemicals, and lab-grown meat to those challenges that most inform our response. A rapid move to emergent, decentralized, and regenerative food systems, which he has been advocating for many years. Christian is a permaculturist, homesteader, and a father with a background in artificial intelligence, and I would say a deep love for humanity. Thank you for returning to the show. It's my pleasure to be back, Bobby. Thanks very much. So tell us, you know, right now, it's kind of common knowledge that we're headed for a food crisis. Even President Biden sort of announced it, uh, telegraphed it. What is the, what are the causes of the food shortage crisis? That's a big question, Bobby. And, you know, we can go back. It's it's hard to even know where to start with that, because certainly we can go back to even under uh, George W. Bush, right before Obama, liquidating the U.S.'s strategic grain reserves. Um, of course, you, you know, even going back further than that, the whole Rockefeller takeover of agriculture and this gradual uh, destruction of the way that humans have grown food since the dawn of time and replacing it with what we now call modern but highly toxic petrochemical agriculture. And so I would really say that this is a generations long plan, but I'm, I, probably you're, you're asking more about this acute situation. And so that's one where I think governments have been, in fact, it's now bearing out that governments have been overstating, particularly the, uh, the USDA, have been overstating their stocks for some time. And so we've been sort of cruising for a day of reckoning um, it, at any rate. And of course, within the last two years, we've had uh, the supply chain challenges because of Corona, uh, a series of weather challenges, um, uh, diesel shortages now, parts shortages, sort of a confluence of things, even just the, uh, the inflation itself is uh, a form of real economic trial for farmers. And all of these things together spell a perfect storm that is, as we're seeing, having very real effects on the availability and production of food. And when you talk about the Rockefeller plan, you're talking about the Green Revolution, right? Absolutely, yeah. So with that as a as a as an outset, and then this Green Revolution 2.0. You know, I know you're familiar with with Vandana Shiva, and she speaks uh, speaks frequently about the Green Revolution 2.0, where the Gates Foundation has sort of taken off where that Rockefeller agriculture left off, and doing things now to the to the uh, you know the 21st century, really taking over, trying to to patent and own the very genetics that make up our entire ecosystem. So that sort of warfare on uh, all of the uh, vast biodiversity of plants and wildlife that feed us. Now it's all being rephrased to animals and even plant life is dirty and dangerous. And that's a phrase that, that I've used consistently through the years because that is really the way that, that they seek to characterize our interaction with animals and our dependence on food that, that we eat grown in nature. That's not what you know a transhumanist technocrat wants to see because anyone can grow food and you can save seeds from heirloom varieties the abundance that flows from this and i hope we talk more about how easy and rewarding it is to uh, to cultivate food i think it's something innate to humanity and it is that exactly that relationship with nature and to god that the transhumanists seek to sever when they take from us that uh, that that ability to cultivate our own food you know even just looking at what makes us who we are you know so many of our holidays are tied to the harvest calendar and to our relationship with Earth. And so all of this really spells uh, a reformatting of humanity and overriding it with, you know, uh, uh, human 2.0 and food 2.0 is part of that. And that's why we're seeing this war on agriculture, the absolute war on real meat, replacing it with lab meat, replacing the, uh, the, the organic good farms with now this uh, technocratic approach, the vertical indoor, indoor farms, of course, that they were control. So at the at the core of it, you know, as Kissinger said, this is a this is a, a a bid for total control. His words were, "If you control oil, you control nations. But if you control food, you control people." And that, at the end of the day, is really the name of the game right now. Yeah, and just to bring, you know, I I wrote about a lot of these issues in my book, The Real Anthony Fauci, and about 
particularly about the Gates, the transition from Rockefeller to the Gates Foundation in engineering this broader transition of traditional agriculture, of subsistence agriculture, um, uh, and particularly in Africa, from the sorghum, from barley, from uh, cassava, plantains, et cetera, to try to integrate African farmers into the kind of globalist agenda by getting persuading them that the United States and our large corporations like Kraft and McDonald's and Cargill could lift them out of poverty if they will only transition to Monsanto's GMO corn uh, and to round up ready agriculture to chemical fertilizers. And one of the things that Gates has done over the past several years is to finance uh, the construction of supply chains. And by the way, he is heavily invested in all of those companies in Kraft and McDonald's and Coca-Cola and Cargill and Monsanto, create a sub supply chain in Africa and then to use his economic power and his, economic, and his political power over the WHO to persuade African governments to pressure their own citizens to transition to this, this kind of agriculture. And, you know, the real, I think, reckoning had happened in Africa during the COVID pandemic, during the lockdowns, when those supply chains were shut down to the United States and the corn was rotting on the dock and the Africans who believed you know, the Gates agenda and Bill Clinton who promised to go in the 90s to go into those countries and lift them out of poverty. And suddenly we turned off those uh, the, the economic relationships with the United States and you had 10,000 children starving to death every month because of the shutdown of agriculture. And I don't want to talk a lot, dominate this, but I'm just summarizing kind of all the things that you've been talking about. And you re referred to Vandana Shiva and her critique of Bill Gates because we have seed banks that were created, international seed banks, that were created to preserve heritage seeds that humanity has used to grow crops. And a lot of those seeds were being lost. There was an international effort to preserve them. We preserve them in seed banks across around the world, about a dozen seed banks. And somehow Bill Gates has gone and got control of those seed banks and is doing genetic engineering on the seeds in order to alter them just enough so that he can patent them. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, it's a bid to create a new asset class, which is nature. You know, Multi-trillion dollar asset class that where all of the comments can be liquidated for cash, can be privatized and owned, including our food. And part of that effort appears to be Gates's crusade to control farmland in our country and around the world. He is now the biggest owner of farmland in the United States. And as you said, part of the agenda seems to be getting human beings off the farm. He's partnered with Apple and Google to create robotic farmers. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very kind of sinister agenda. Without a doubt. And, um, and a lot of that flows from the, the Gates Ag One Foundation that was set up just to do exactly what you say. They say, well, we're going we're gonna to bring enlightenment to you, agriculture enlightenment. And here's our special CRISPR engineered seeds that are going to give you better yields and keep you coming back for more. Yeah, it's it, it, sinister. It only begins to really scratch the surface, if you ask me, of, uh, of the depth of, uh, of how of how evil this this agenda really is but um yeah i mean you said a lot there and i'm just trying to think the seed banks are another example of of how they yeah how they are trying to centralize and then take control over this this really the the library of earth's genetics that have gotten us this far and uh and that is one thing i think those those efforts are noble and we should all actually continue to do that the, the problem if you ask me the problem there was that it was a centralized effort by right? collecting all of these things in one place which then afforded him 
the opportunity to seize control. And that's why I think the key word, you know, as you said at the outset, the key action that we all have to be taking right now is to be doing it ourselves, is to be growing things in our own garden, is to be saving those seeds. And that's, you know, this is, again, this is the way it was done. That's why you have, you know, the, the mortgage lifter uh, heirloom variety of tomatoes, because it actually saved, you know, Uncle Jim Bob's house three generations ago, or Granny had her special zucchinis that always uh, were prolific come fall. There were, there were people and stories behind these heirloom varieties, because that's, that's where they all came from. And they've been sort of filtered down to a few select few that maybe we recognize. And then the, the, the big um, uh, few varieties that are owned by the seed companies at this point, and they just want to continue to corral people in those directions. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right there. And another part of that agenda that really, it really uh, gets kind of diabolical is the whole fake food um, uh, trend, which we're being pressured constantly at restaurants, at grocery stores, um, you know, through advertising and through kind of uh, moral rectitude, telegraphing and signaling uh, to eat fake, fake foods like impossible burgers. And when you actually look into them, they are the opposite of healthy. They're the, uh, the opposite of environmental friendly, but they again, allow these chemists to control our food supply. That's it. And I'm glad you said they're both, they're terrible for us. They're full of phytoestrogens and all sorts of nasty. It just looks like dog food, really, when you look at the ingredient labels. But, but also it was important that you mentioned it's also terrible for the environment because all of these products come from this soy protein that's or, or pea protein, uh, either of which are farmed in vast monoculture, you know, monocropped farms, which is the beginning. This is the genesis of the problem that we're describing today. That's how we got into a position of food shortage in the first place with these modern commercial monocropping farms. And that's why we need to be talking more about the return to, again, decentralized and regenerative systems that can be producing for all of us going forward. You know, when you have a monoculture, the only way it is to, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a circus for pests. And uh, the only way to preserve monocultures from pests is the intensive use of chemical pesticides. So those impossible burgers that you're eating because you think you're being healthy are actually just, you're just eating glyphosate and neonicotinoids and the worst kind of witch's brew of toxics that you're putting in your system every time you bite into an impossible burger. Yeah, yeah, and you're, you're exactly right. Well, a, uh, a circus of insects though, is a buffet of, of uh, cash for Monsanto, right? So there's a reason that these same industries are involved in, in, these, uh, in this takeover of agriculture. They want, uh, they want to be there from the get-go. And even there, I think it's clear at this point that we're at the, the tail end of a dying, you know, these are not sustainable. And so when I say that, it means you can only sort of play that game and deplete the soil and spray nasty, toxic stuff on your crops and eke out a yield for so long. And we're getting to the end of that paradigm, not just from the deployed, uh, depleted soil, which means that the vegetables in our supermarkets aren't actually nutritious anymore. That, not only that, but, you know, for example, I saw a story coming out of um, Florida that said there's a, um, there's a, uh, a citrus disease that's been gradually taking more and more of the production out of the trees. And at this point, they're, you know, the scientists are frantically working on it, but they're just now trying to extend the life cycle of these trees by a couple more years, and then we'll deal with the problem when we get there, right? So it's a massive case, not just the oranges, but across the board of kicking the can. How long can we get away with these terrible agricultural practices? How long can we get away with shoving animals into unspeakably horrible conditions in these CAFOs, the concentrated animal feeding operations? You know, no one in their right mind would advocate that this kind of monocropping at scale or the CAFOs are the right way to do things, or even a moral way. You know, it's just, it's atrocious. And I think everyone would say that. Um, the, the next step, though, is not just to condemn the way we've been doing it, because that's, I mean, that's what's being done, is they're pointing at this thing that they have created and saying, this is disgusting. And that's why we need to fail forward into, you know, our CRISPR-modified fake meat and into our um, genetically engineered dinosaur they've actually done some there's a few companies some of which bill gates funds that are looking at uh, taking extinct animal dna 
and then recreate it's like Jurassic Park all over again recreating meats so you can experience the mouthfeel and unique taste of a woolly mammoth this is the kind of uh, technocratic nastiness that they want to that's why I say they're defiling the food supply um, and so yeah all of this is why there's a war on real regenerative practices and on good animal husbandry practices uh, they just want to point at the th nasty things the cafos and all these things that they've created that are terrible and then say that's why we have to do away with all animals i mean the, the world Eco economic forum actually talks about the post animal economy and so when i say there's a war on meat that's not a that's not rhetoric and that's not an exaggeration this is this is all actually very much in the open uh heading towards that post animal economy you know we've heard also um about food plants being destroyed and food, food, food um, shipments and supply chains. How real is all of that? I don't think it, they, you can, I, mean, I don't know how you would say it's fake. These things are actually exploding. And when you look at the frequency of these events, you know, it, it was already on an uptick a couple of years ago when I started talking about how our, it seems like our food give, supply. Give is an example, fast. give an example of, a, you know, of a, of a plant that's been destroyed. I can give you a, a litany of examples from grain silos and grain elevators, uh, plenty of barn fires. Uh, the port of Beirut is one that's particularly noteworthy because it's not only was it a huge explosion, but it has catapulted Lebanon into a, a food crisis in which you know they've already got an economic crisis. And so the situation is pretty dire down there. But uh, that was a very um, visual example because that's their main grain reserve right there in the port, which exploded. And so they were up a creek at that point. Um, with the US, there's there's just many more facilities, but there have been sugar refineries, uh, grain elevators and grain silos, like I said, which means the farmers often have no place to take the wheat when they harvest. And um, got, you know, you can find a video that I made that just goes through a long list of these things. In fact, if you go to iceagefarmer.com slash fire, there's a map of uh, uh, some number of these events right there. That's that's a good convenient way to to pull up the data. Yeah, I mean during the COVID crisis, you had the same thing happen to ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine production right. facilities, including one of the biggest in the world, which was in Taiwan, that um, you know was uh, mysteriously burned to the ground in a what was called an, an unsolved arson fire. Um, and, you know, it's hard to even talk about this stuff without even sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but it's uh, it's pretty eerie how kind of regularly it's happening. Yeah, without a doubt. And, um, the, you know, the flip side is if you don't want to talk about this because you're worried that someone will think that you're crazy, there is plenty of open, objective stuff that we can talk about. You know, this is, I would argue we're now, maybe, and this is what's interesting, Bobby, is if we'd had this conversation a year or two ago, I would have been, it would have been a very different conversation. You know, for one, there weren't already empty shelves. And so a lot of this would have been me saying, look, I'm hearing from farmers that the government is lying. We've got these natural cycles of the sun, which mean we're going to have uh, more challenging seasons ahead. And uh, they're openly talking about it. Look at the food chain reaction game, which is still worth talking about it. But now we're already, you know, the ship has sailed. We're already in the middle of a food crisis. Like you said, we've got Biden, but also Trudeau um, and the German Chancellor Schultz all saying yeah we're going to enter food shortages here and uh, but but stunningly none of them offer any solutions right none of them talk about how we did this in world war ii and there were victory gardens and we were actually able to contribute using backyard gardens uh, uh, make an impact right make a meaningful sizable impactful difference in our in our food systems when everyone just went outside of their backyard and had a, a few uh, square uh, square feet of, of garden space. It doesn't take a whole lot to actually really move the needle on that. And that's something, you know, that's just to really amplify the good news here is that we can actually can make a difference. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the food chain reaction game was, was one example of where they sort of tipped the hat here. And so to, to sort of, um, the short story there is just as event 201 looked forward and sort of predicted that there would be a coronavirus outbreak and sort of walked through what the uh, scenario would look like, these tabletop exercises. Uh, a similar thing was done by George Soros-funded, John Podesta-run uh, food chain reaction game in 2015, which looked ahead to the year 2020 and said due to climate change and a series of financial and economic problems, 
uh, there would be interruptions into the supply chains that would then ca cause a cascading series of failures in our food supply. And this would cause food prices to rise. And at that point, things would get really crazy because countries would start uh, stop exporting their food to other countries. And of course, there are some countries who are net importers, meaning they depend on the exports of other breadbasket countries to feed their people. And uh, when, uh, you know, when the food chain reaction game ran through this, they eventually, you know, after some uh, rounds of deliberation, they got to the point where they said, we need better international cooperation, right? We, we shouldn't have countries acting on their own behalf. These pesky nation states aren't going to do it. We need global governance to get through these global problems, right? That's, of course, what they would come up with. Uh, and then actually, they also said, we need a carbon tax. And in Europe, they came up with a meat tax as well. Um, so this was only six uh, years ago. And since then, uh, the, the Rockefeller Foundation has released a paper about resetting the table, the, the need to fundamentally transform the food systems of the United States. Uh, the, there's uh, a, a commission called the Eat Lancet Commission, which has been working hand in hand with the World Economic Forum. In fact, they call themselves the Davos of food. And they have been describing how a fundamental transformation, they call it the great food transformation, about how this need to, again, reset all, and they, they always throw in these same keywords, reset the, the food systems of the planet, the great reset, um, to ensure that we you know, get to an equitable, sustainable food system. Well, all of that is talking about the changes that you and I are already talking about, moving to fake food, moving off of natural farming because animals are dirty and dangerous. And um, so when you look at the food chain reaction game and these simulations and these plans that are all open, it's actually, quite easy to say you know there's a there's a group of people that have the means motive and have had the opportunity now to uh, to make a move to shut down the food production of humanity in order to try and attempt a hostile takeover it and we're now in the process of that we're walking through the script that food chain reaction game described let me go back to another thing you talked about, which is the decline of nutrients and food, the fact that we're eating a lot of volume, but that there is basically almost nothing healthy that's left in it. If you eat a, uh, you know, if you eat an ear of corn today, a lot of the, the, the traditional nutrients um, and minerals that were part of that bushel, the original bushel, have been leached out by pesticides and they're simply not available for uptake in the impoverished soils that in which these plants are now growing. I think there are plenty of actually studies on this. Just taking a look at, you know, if you pick up uh, some, some greens from the supermarket shelves, what's actually in that at this point? And how do you compare that to, you know, if you were growing this in your backyard uh, and you had it immediately upon harvesting it fresh while they're still living enzymes, and all of the, the nutrients haven't yet started to be metabolized by the plant while it's en route to you, then uh, it's just, a, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not even comparable. It's, it's just a real superfood in your backyard compared to just dead leaves at the, at the supermarket, yeah. Christian, how do we resist this? If you're the average American family, what, what should you be doing? Yeah, so the, the, the natural response to a takeover of food production is for us to all start growing food, is to move back to decentralized food production. And I say back to because it is the way that humanity for most of its uh, existence has, has been there, right? We all used to grow some amount of food. And if it was great because if I had a bad harvest and that happens sometimes, if I have a bad year, then I can go to my neighbor next door and borrow some of his potatoes and get through the season, plus plant some of those and come back next year. And I can be there for him, vice versa, in a following season. We've all sort of had our back uh, like that. It's a, so it's a safety net for our species, as well as just being a very sensible way to do things compared to what, what we've just been describing in this conversation, which is a completely centralized uh, ownership model where total control lies in the hands of very few people. And they are actively you know, using that to turn it into a toxic food system that's poisoning us. So yeah, the natural reaction is for us all to start growing our own food, for us all to build gardens, 
uh, and get involved with a, with a, a return to local regenerative food systems. And if you know, I already hear some people saying, "Well, great, I've got a you know a black thumb. I'm not really one for the garden." The good news here for you is, well, first of all, I, I would say try it anyway. <laughs> it's a lot of people are very surprised when they actually go out there and connect with the plants and get their hands dirty at how quickly you learn. And uh, and you know, I'm working on a book right now, but I've been working on a, a YouTube channel for years that is all about getting people to overcome that fear to really just get out there and, and, and try things and try putting the focus on growing good soil, because when you grow good soil, you almost can't help but produce lots of amazing plants. Um, but, uh, but getting out there, if you don't want to get, you know, if that's not really your forte, or you don't have the space for it, I promise you, whatever your background is, whatever your unique skills, your unique experience is from your life, we need you right now. Like this is, this is, as I said, we've we've passed the, the go point for a global food crisis. And that means that's going to be on top of all these other things we're going through, the economic challenges, the, uh, you know, they're talking about grids down and other situations. It, it looks pretty, um, pretty hairy here for, for a time in the near future here. And so whatever it is that you've experienced in your life, this is the time where you bring that to the table. And we all come and there are people needed to you know, stand up new websites with shopping carts for the farmer down the street who maybe he had a deal for how to get his food to market before, but because of the supply chain going crazy, you know, he needs, he needs a new way to connect directly with consumers in the area. And if you're a, a web kind of a person, then you can do that. If you're a lawyer, there are plenty of legal challenges facing farmers right now. And, uh, and there's a need for you to work with your city council to try and grease the skids of a local food systems. Maybe you're able to provide if not subsidies, then tax breaks for local producers, or if they sell within the community, you know, whatever you can do, whatever knowledge of, of uh, an experience you've got, bring it to the table right now, try and fix this food system that is in, in your community around you so that you guys are, are better off. That's, that's the, the bottom line, Bobby, on how as Americans, we respond to a global food situation. What are the central political challenges to solving this issue? Or what are I don't the think challenges that are driving it? Yeah, I, I don't see a whole lot of, uh, honestly, I don't see a whole lot of leadership left in the U.S. You know, what, what under any color of, you know, uh, it was under Bush and Obama, we were liquidating our strategic grain reserves and waging con complete economic warfare <laughs> on our farmers. Um, even under Trump, we opened up the doors and we're shipping as much, you know, record, record, record amounts of corn and other grains and soybeans out to China. That's continued under Biden. Biden has waged complete warfare on farmers. One of the first things he did on his first day in office was pass a series of executive orders that told the USDA they needed to go to a net zero, you know, carbon emissions, meaning farming has to be complete. You know, it's 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 really crazy what the USDA is putting people through. They're actively moving more land into, into environmental conservation and taking it out of production. Um, so there's there's just a long list of things that the Biden administration is doing to make life for farmers very harder, including eliminating the uh, adding to the inheritance tax so that farms really just can't change hands. And that I mean, that's war on the generational American farms at the heart of it. But um, so it's, it's a big question. I don't see any real leadership within the U.S. government. I see mostly. Uh, people that are shepherding through the agenda that's coming down from the WEF and the technocrats at the UN, you know, the United Nations Food Systems Summit described a lot of the things we're talking about today, which was that summit was heavily infiltrated by Gates Foundation funded people. So there's not within the US government, I just don't see a lot of uh, resistance uh, how about on the, on the agenda or anywhere. Yeah. How about on the ground in farm country? Are there any organizations like the Farmers Union, which used to stand up for a lot of these issues? Are there any organizations like that that people should support? There are now many who are standing up and saying, you know, we're in a crisis. We're in a crisis situation. And if we don't have emergency capital issued to farmers so that they can afford the fertilizer to, to feed these crops and afford even if you afford the seeds to put in the ground, then there's just not going to be food. And I think, I think part, this is true of most people around the world, but particularly of Americans, we have lived for so long as we entered the grocery store and see this multicolored, you know, I, I love the, the rainbow assortment of all sorts of produce and fruits and vegetables from around the world. That's just always, somehow it's always just been there, which means that a lot of people think that somehow it will always just be there. 
Um, and right now we're finding that that's not going to be true. So hopefully this is that opportunity where because of the last two years and the way things have gone down and, uh, you know, I think it's very hard for anyone who is intellectually honest and looking at the situation in the last few years to say that this was just some accident. It was a series of miscalculations and missteps on their part. And maybe, maybe they were wrong about the math. It's like, no, this was a very deliberate, intentional warfare going on in our population. And that warfare extends into the domain of food. And so, the, the, again, the natural reaction for us all is not to depend on the government to, to save us, but to go out and start those victory gardens and save those seeds. We start this amazing heirloom genetics that, that, that make up a, a resilient food system. It's not just Monsanto's seeds for everyone on earth. It's everybody has something and maybe yours fails, but that's all right because I've got one now. And that's where true sustainability comes from. Christian, tell us again how people can reach you and support you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a website at iceagefarmer.com where you can find all my reports going back to the very beginning. Somehow I am still on YouTube, but uh, a lot of my videos don't stay on there. So the, the way to, to really peruse the, the depth of research on the zero carbon agenda and, uh, and all of these food issues and on the solar cycles is on iceagefarmer.com. I've also got the Telegram channel at t.me slash iceagefarmer. Christian Westbrook, thank you for your activism and for your uh, thoughtful opposition to this, uh, this coup d'etat against our food supply and against humanity and democracy and national sovereignty and all the other weird stuff that's going on now. Thank you very much. Thank you.